Using number 68, Joe DeLamalier's block on Burgess Owen, Simpson cut back to a record. O.J. Simpson was now the all-time single-season rushing champ. Forty-nine years ago today, O.J. Simpson became the first NFL running back to rush for over 2,000 yards in a single season, cementing his historic one-year performance against the New York Jets in the final game of the 1973 season. This game, however, would also be historic in a different sense as it would be the final game for one of the NFL's most successful yet under-recognized coaches of all time, Weeb Eubank. Eubank earlier in the year announced that 1973 would be his final season as the Jets head coach, capping off a career that puts him in a class all by himself. He was the head of the 1958 NFL championship team Baltimore Colts, who won what came to be known as the greatest game ever played against the New York Giants that revolutionized pro football on television. He then led the Colts to repeat as champions in 1959 and followed up this feat years later with the Jets by winning the AFL championship over the Oakland Raiders in 1968, becoming the first and only coach to win a championship in both leagues. A couple weeks later, Weeb led the Jets to perhaps the greatest upset in sports history with the victory against his former team, the Baltimore Colts, at a time when the AFL needed to win a Super Bowl to legitimize the AFL-NFL merger. His greatest accomplishment, it can be argued, is being a coach to mold not one but two Hall of Fame quarterbacks in John Unitas and Joe Namath. But despite this resume, Weeb's effort to field a competitive team fell flat in 1973, as he oversaw a dismal 4-10 record in his last year as a coach that ended with O.J. Simpson putting himself in the history books against the green and white. While many newspaper writers and television pundits crowded the Bills' locker room to ask O.J. about his legendary season during the postgame, one writer from the New York Post was more fascinated about the disappointing end to Eubanks' distinguished career. This was Paul Zimmerman, better known by his contemporaries as Dr. Z. It's this moment at the end of the game that begins his stellar 1974 book, the last season of Wee Bubank that documented the Jets throughout their last year with Wee Bubank at the helm, chronicling the end of an era for a franchise and a coach who changed the scope of professional football forever. Through Zimmerman's reporting, the reader is taken inside the organization to see the unfolding of a season that's doomed to fail. Injuries to marquee players like Namath were obvious detriments as were holdouts from other star players like John Riggins and Winston Hill. To make matters worse, Weeb's last year would be one that had no nostalgic sympathy from the fans in the press, for by the end of the season, fans would be hanging banners that read Impeach Weeb and TDs weren't cheap, Weeb is, believing that Eubanks' decision making was holding the team back. But though the book is filled with weekly recaps of every game that season, the last season of Weeb Eubank is much more than a behind-the-scenes look at the inner working of the Jets. Rather, it's a book in which Zimmerman not only tries to decipher how Eubank had declined the way he did, but also serves as a short biography of a pro football coach who by and large flew under the radar. Eubank, after all, didn't have the fiery voice and passionate catchphrases like Vince Lombardi or Don Shula. Weeb also wasn't regarded as a schematic genius like Tom Landry or his mentor, Paul Brown, instead opting to stress on fundamentals and utilizing a small number of plays that were run to perfection. For these reasons, Weeb, even during his time, was a coach that many fans may not have respected highly enough as they did other coaches. But for a student of the game like Zimmerman, who knew there was more than met the eye with Weeb, this season was the perfect time to look back at Weeb's personal history to show how his experiences molded him as a coach and how those experiences came to limit him in his last year. Going back to Weeb's boyhood days of playing football, Zimmerman recounts many of the moments that proved to be formative for a coach in the making. After suffering an injury to his left hand as a quarterback in a high school game, for instance, Weeb used this time on the sidelines to observe the game in its entire scope evaluating players and schemes while he recovered from injury, igniting the coach's mindset that laid within him. While playing college football at Miami of Ohio, 
Weeb also moonlighted as both a semi-pro football and baseball player during the Great Depression to support his family, an experience that taught him to be frugal with money that almost certainly impacted how he developed his shrewd negotiation tactics. As a high school coach at Oxford and McGuffey in Ohio, Weeb's team that had only lost two games in their first 27 contests narrowly defeated an inferior team coached by Homer Eddington. Weeb was so impressed with Homer's football knowledge and ability that he hired him as a Jets talent scout over 30 years later, highlighting Weeb's memory for great football plays and talent. Even during his tenure with the great Paul Brown, Weeb made note of how athletes responded to coaching, and Weeb decided to be more lenient with them, for he believed that for players to play like men, they shouldn't be treated like boys. He rarely registered fines to his players for detrimental conduct or enforced strict curfews and dress codes to his players, an uncommon practice for a sport that thrived off authoritarian coaching. Unlike Brown, Weeb even left the play calling duties to the players as opposed to micromanaging the game himself. But as any great reporter does, Zimmerman provides nuance and complexity to his subject as he refocuses his attention throughout the book to finding answers to his question of how Weeb's last season, and frankly his final years with the Jets, have resulted in disappointment. As mentioned before, Weeb had a reputation for being a stingy negotiator. He refused to work with agents, preferring instead to negotiate face-to-face -face with the players, most of whom were overmatched, as Zimmerman states. Weeb would never let the players get the upper hand and was even accused at times of being dishonest. Arguably the greatest consequence of his negotiating tactics came in the 1973 season, when the Jets starting halfback John Riggin sat out all of training camp until he was offered a $150,000 extension, to which we would eventually agree to $130,000 after a six month standoff. But perhaps nothing encapsulates Eubanks' reputation as a coach, however, than the long conversations Zimmerman had in the middle of the book with Carol Rosenblum, former owner of the Baltimore Colts who hired and fired Eubank. When speaking about Weeb, Rosenblum told Zimmerman, quote, you never find a better man for building a ball club, but after he builds it, you have to take another look. Rosenblum cites many examples of the philosophical differences that grew between him and Eubank. Most notably, that Weeb had grown stale in his position because he felt he didn't need to change his approach since he won a pair of NFL titles. Rosenblum oftentimes encouraged Weeb to play younger and healthier players over banged up veterans, but Eubank disregarded this advice, preferring to rely on a select few veterans for the team's success. Zimmerman then recalls the various times in the 73 season when Weeb chose not to play young, talented players instead of aging veterans such as benching Jim Nance for multiple games when he failed to pick up a blitz in the opening game against Green Bay. Dr. Z also concedes that Weeb's cheap approach to free agency and trades was a detriment to adding depth to the team, as shown when the Jets suffered greatly when Namath went down for two months. Rosenblum also discussed Weeb's communication deficiencies, particularly him being only open with star players, going so far as relying on them to disseminate criticism to other players. Again, Zimmerman writes down the times when players and members of the Jets coaching staff complained that Weeb would put up a wall between himself and those he felt he couldn't trust. As a result, Weeb formed a reputation of creating a double standard with his star players and being a man who refused to delegate authority to his assistant coaches, leaving them unclear of where they stood with Weeb. Clearly, this chapter of the book answers many of Zimmerman's questions about Weeb's unfortunate final act as a coach. It also provides the reader a unique insight into understanding the complexity of a man who had great stature in the world of pro football that tried to leave on top and ride off into the sunset. But as Zimmerman writes in his book, pro football isn't played in the storybooks, and the last season of Weeb Eubank emphasizes the fact that rarely does imagination match reality. Overall, the last season of Weeb Eubank is regarded as one of the greatest books written on football, for it left behind a complex portrait of a man with a legendary career that has since been largely forgotten by the modern NFL fan base. But Zimmerman's book in many ways speaks to the greater theme of life in the NFL through Eubank's eyes, 
as we routinely see great players and coaches that the game has passed by. Greatly do professionals in pro football have a Hollywood ending to their career, for no one can escape time for long in a violent business. But once their time is done, history shows the impact that an individual had on the game, the league, and those who surrounded them. And Zimmerman's portrait of Weeb as a coach and a man is the prime example of how one man's love for the game motivates him to give his life to football. And even though Weeb never truly received the recognition he deserves and may never, Zimmerman shows us in this book that Weeb's life within the sport made football a better game.